another draft physics video production. Um, kind of a draft video, just going through some of the stuff I'm thinking about or rethinking, tempting to think if there's some other explanation, some better explanation. Um, just oh, camera, <laughs> don't touch it. Uh, nothing but trouble. Anyway, um, so um, yeah, this is what this stuff. Now, I say, okay, that's what the the basic universe looks like. It's just these little bits of energy, momentum, that are constantly bombarding everything. And that, um, you know, the stuff we see can be explained as some form, some pattern created in the uh, order, the balance, uh, the arrangement of this stuff based on a simple principle that you can trap it, you know, that you can have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, remember, I can't go any further than this. Okay. There, there's my line. Uh, wow, I did that pretty good. Anyway, um, yeah, so the idea is, is that there's stuff moving in all these directions and that if you can make this stuff do this, um, you know, <laughs> this thing, uh, you know, a circle or whatever, if you can force it to get stuck, that that momentum won't get where it's going. It'll be stuck going in a circle. So if you can deflect it. And the idea is, is, <clears throat> is there some way to deflect it without causing an interaction that causes the momentum to move in a different direction and that's the trick of it so um, context let's understand that conventional physics doesn't have any mechanism for why atoms or protons and electrons would move they just say they do so they're sitting inside of an atom somewhere a uh, little proton and a little electron <clears throat> and they basically just say there's something over here and this stuff just for whatever because some bent geodesic says so it all of a sudden just moves in this direction it just moves because there's something over here and there's no explanation for how it moves how it accelerates how it does any of that stuff and you know that's a pretty big um, omission from the physics is explaining why something moves and then other people have theories about all kinds of you know there's all kinds of tornadoes going on here and you know all kinds of stuff swirling about this way and this way and somehow all that swirly stuff doesn't need any mechanism to make it swirl you know it doesn't need any forces to act on it to cause the swirl and um, somehow the swirl causes things to move in a direction, but there's no explanation for how the tornado causes anything to move sideways and all these other ways. So, I mean, there's just nothing out there. Um, <clears throat> and I just don't see anybody attempting to reason through a better explanation of why things move. And I'm arguing that they move because there's or they're forced to move and there's something called force and it does this stuff where it kind of seems quantized it seems like it's in little pieces of momentum and the momentum in most cases that we can understand like Maxwell's drawings for example um, his more elemental his most elemental drawings will be of objects radiating and this is the mathematics here this creates your inverse square law you know this stuff here um, and <clears throat> it's really just calculating the, you would call this, uh, for any test charge you choose, you know, either red or blue, you just calculate how much, <clears throat> the red means attraction, the blue means repulsion, you just calculate how much repulsion versus attraction, and you can figure it all out, and so you don't need any of this stuff going around here like this, uh, you know, that they... They like to draw with little arrows and such. You know, none of that stuff's happening. Anyway, <clears throat> so I'm just giving you the <clears throat> where to start <clears throat> kind of thing. Just 
saying this is where my starting point was that there's got to be a better explanation than all this you know bent thing does it or um, virtual in the case of conventional physics they start inventing a virtual force that looks like what I'm saying exists but doesn't really exist they don't account for it so the most interesting observation I mean one that I never heard talked about in physics is the fact that you have this you know conundrums so you can un understand sort of like these force bits you could sort of understand that if they have momentum in opposite directions you could sort of understand that what's going to happen when those two things hit each other is there's going to be a, a reaction you could say if they did hit each other and you could argue that what's going to leave is really going to be exactly like if they never hit each other I mean if they never hit each other you have an arrow coming out this way and you have an, a, a force going this way and if they do hit each other and they reflect you're going to have the same thing you're going to have a piece of momentum going one way and another piece going the other way and all of their speed or momentum will be preserved conserved and so it's non-consequential this can't mean anything to the force bits so they can move perpetually through space and you can imagine them missing each other or you can imagine them hitting each other and it's inconsequential theoretically now if you do make them two different colors well then you can see the difference you know then a you know a head-on collision between a red and a blue um, you would be able to tell because if they miss each other the reds over here and the blues going this way but if they hit each other and reflect you could understand the reds going this way and the blues going that way and that's a change that's a difference than what you would expect um, <clears throat> So that's just another piece of the puzzle. I don't know how significant, but it's there. Um, so the real interesting part is electrons and protons. I mean, I, they never really explain the difference between, say, uh, regular matter. Okay, so regular matter, you could take a wrench, for example, in space, and you can throw it, okay, with... Uh, velocity and it'll just keep going it'll just go 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 forever and ever and ever now the trick is if you took an electron and try to do the same thing it'll stop it just won't keep going same with the proton it won't keep going either you can't just throw the proton into space and hope that it gets anywhere so something between the elemental bits and the well, I guess I should use the magic word, drag. But the reason why the electrons and protons don't um, keep going is because of this idea. So the idea is is that this force is out there, um, this little bits of stuff. And I'm arguing there's two kinds of forces, so I'll try to keep true to that. Um, I'll try not to take too many shortcuts. And the idea is this force compresses everything it's around everything and it's so pushing on everything and so this thing in space is really jostling around a little bit it's moving this way a little this way a little all the time being pushed around in this even force if it was all alone in the universe so if it's all by itself in the universe it would be given pieces of momentum so each time something hit it um, well I should probably use the right color um, <clears throat> the thing itself this little bit can gain momentum from those hits so the force essentially goes in I would argue there's a pure reflex reflection out um, and this is just an exchange of what this thing has stored so it has stored inside of it stuff and the storage is in the form of traps you know stuff goes in goes into a circle and the circle just processes through space and so that's what's taken place, but the problem with that is, is let's just presume it's processing this way, just so we can make the point. As it's processing, as it's moving through space and it's trapped, that is, it's slowed down because it's doing all this right turn stuff. Um, and you can sort of understand the freeness of that. You know, it's like gravity in the Earth; it just keeps going around and around and around and around, and theoretically 
there's no consumption of anything called energy to do that. The Earth doesn't slow down and the Sun doesn't get smaller to do the gravity thing. But the idea would be is, is it moves into, the, say, it's a force that pushed it. So it's a f little force came in, hit something that was spinning and gave it precession, gave it a little more momentum this way than it had going that way. And so it's processing through space. And as it processes, it's going to run into more force from this direction than force from this direction. And so therefore, there's going to be an unevenness in it and it's going to be slowed down going to lose its velocity. So that would be the theory of why these matter bits, you can move them, but if you, <clears throat> you know, move them through the field, you know, in a direction, that they will be dragged to a halt because they are just going to incidentally, by probability, hit more things going uh, in the opposite direction to their motion than they'll hit going the same way because the same way they're obviously moving away from them and creating more distance and so less of them are going to hit them because there's just more distance that has to be traveled before they can get to them and you know so that's drag now the interesting part that like I said I never really heard physics anywhere talk about is the fact that you know we just kind of know this stuff now that okay so electrons and protons are drag to a halt. So like in an accelerator, um, let's just, you know, well, I'll do a little quick, you know, a simple diagram of an accelerator. So the idea is, is that <clears throat> you have a voltage differential here that you're going to push electrons or protons across. And so they're going to gain a velocity here in this little spot. And the idea is you shoot them and they're going, let's say, 100 miles an hour when you, when they come out. And then they're going to go, you're going to hold them in magnets so they go all the way around here without being disturbed. But by the time they get here, they're only going 10 miles an hour. So they've lost 90% of their velocity. But you're going to shoot them across the voltage again. So they're going to be going 110 miles an hour when they come out the next time, right? So you can sort of get the idea that each time you go through, you lose a lot of momentum. But you start now with 20 miles an hour here. You know, now you've got to. 120 miles an hour and so each time you go around you're gaining more and more output velocity here and eventually you get this up to whatever one zillion miles an hour and you know you've accelerated your your proton so they, they know this this is the theory this is how the thing machine works so they know this is true that protons and electrons unlike wrenches and other stuff you can't throw these things into space and have any hope that they'll go anywhere. They'll go a certain distance and then they'll decelerate. They'll go slower and slower and slower and slower. And then eventually they'll be captured by something and they'll go into some swirly thing. And we sort of see that in cloud chambers. We see electrons come out and then they go into some sort of weird looking spiral and just crash. They die. They die from us being able to see their momentum doing anything anymore because they lose it. They decelerate. Um, all right, so that's something we know. And then we know that all I need is a nucleus of some kind. So I just need to put a few of these protons and electrons and, uh, you know, neutron is a, probably a key component. Um, don't see, oh, I probably have it in my hand. <laughs> so I could use green for the neutron. But I would argue that the neutron is really just a proton and an electron because that's what they see it decay into. So. It's sort of a fake um, particle. It's, it's really just another form of, a, you could say, a hydrogen atom. Um, and so, it's you know, it's it's not it's a composite. It's not elemental. So the electron and proton, they're the elemental bits. The neutron is clearly a composite. <clears throat> I'd say sort of clearly. Uh, they say that the proton is a composite of quarks and other kinds of crap, but, you know, <laughs> I don't think that's true. Um, but regardless, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, that's just what they interpret from an experiment, you know, and sometimes experiments aren't that clear, so they're just jumping to a conclusion. But anyway, so somehow this, if I put this stuff together and call that a nucleus, 
you know, some a neutron and a proton anyway. Uh, let's just say we have the electron inside the neutron. So you could argue that all um, what you're really talking about, all right, the smallest bit of matter that you could throw into space and it'll keep going. It won't get dragged to a halt. So it'll start behaving like the force bits again. <clears throat> so <clears throat> force bits they don't have a problem moving through space. They don't get dragged. They don't slow down. They're always going to constant speed. Their momentum isn't destroyed in any sense. Electrons and protons, they can't maintain their momentum because the real, the force bits get in the way. They drag them to a halt. Okay. Yeah, I have to think how to spell things. Okay, so these things are affected by drag. And somehow this, though, if I put just this, you know, the, a proton, an electron, and a proton together, somehow I can move that through space. So I can chuck that, and that'll keep going. It won't be dragged to a halt. And, um, you know, there's got to be a reasoning. There's got to be some cause for that effect. And my simple explanation is, is that creates a, you know, you can create some mechanism where you break the drag problem because there's a catch to how the mechanism works. So the catch, one catch I thought of was, <clears throat> you just think about this arrangement. Um, now I've pointed out, probably could use more space. I can always use way up here. Um, you know, that there is a function to how the force interacts with the proton and the electron. And so the reason why there's two forces is essentially because you need these two interactions. You need, you, and the two interactions are, is that what reflects between electrons and electrons, the, the blue stuff always reflects. That is, it hits, <coughs> there's a equal and opposite reflection, and essentially what happens is this goes in and that comes out. So there's just an exchange. And that exchange means though that the the disposition, you know, there's <clears throat> this holds a history in it of stuff that's trapped previously. And what it does is it lets a bird go one way, you know, and it captures a new one going the new way. So it takes on something going this way and it gives back something going the opposite way. And so I've used the analogy of boats and rowing and it works. Um, but anyway, the point is, is you get these perpetual reflections so that the closer the objects will get to each other, the more reflections you get, blah, blah, blah. Now, an interesting catch to that in terms of making, say, a neutron would be, um, you, yeah, I'll just erase this because, frankly, it shouldn't be necessary. <clears throat> um, so something, um, yeah, something I thought about that I just forgot what it was that I was going to get to. <laughs> um, it was there just now. Um, okay, yeah, so if you started with two things far apart, you could understand that, um, you know, they would have the universe between them. So they'd have a, you know, there'd be a bunch of force, you know, between them. And, uh, you know, and then you bring them closer together that same amount of force is going to look like a lot more because it's going to be doing all this reflecting. So it's going to be a lot more force. So I've pointed out you take ping pong paddles as a thought, you know, and you bring two ping pong paddles closer together and you can understand if the ball is moving at a constant speed that, you know, the closer you bring them, I mean, the further apart they are, the less energy in the sense that the less impacts on the paddle and the paddles because they have the constant speed the impact is really dictated by how many interactions you have and so by having the distance you'll double the interactions you know how many times it hits and therefore double the energy in a sense so the the reason why you would expect the paddles to be pushing away from each other you'll increase the pressure and obviously we see this in so many circumstances where you compress something and it increases the pressure. So it's not a big surprise or doesn't say much on its, on its face. <clears throat> but the trick is, is if you went straight into this other object, well then you would compress all of this force, you know, and you'd have all the same force trapped here because it's just going back and forth. 
But if you took a different path than that, you know, if you moved this way, and then moved this way, and then moved this way, and then moved, you know, if you did it in a herky-jerky manner, then you'd keep releasing your extra pressure. So you'd keep letting the pressure, each time you move this way, the pressure going this way would miss you because you're over here now, so it would escape. So all the pressure you collected, the density, would be reduced and you'd keep going back to the normal pressure, that is, whatever space is providing would still provide, create new pressure for you to collect here, but it would always be reduced to the amount of pressure per quantum of space. So if that's, if that's the distance in regular space and you were compressing it to this distance, you're not doing that anymore if you, if you can move out of alignment. So that way an electron could get close theoretically to another electron as long as they, the path they took was crooked. So it's just, I don't know what it means entirely, but I just mean it's a fact that you could have very little pressure between two electrons um, if they get closer to each other in a, in a way where they're never, they don't go a straight line. This is just an interesting fact. Um, and, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So, back to the, the basic um, argument I'm making uh, as the explanation for what overcomes the drag problem is the fact that the protons, the proton and the neutron, so this would be the neutron, this thing here, isn't, you know, uh, this collection, so I'll just mark it with a little dotted line or something. So you just think of that as being the neutron, and then you have the extra proton. And now you have a helium nucleus. I think that's what it is. Well, anyway, so the idea would be is that <coughs> the other trick to the interaction between these objects is, is that if a uh, different force, if a blue thing hits a red thing, it leaves perpendicularly. And there's no consequence here, no momentum exchange. It's really, if if we were to use the boat analogy, you know, there's nobody gets in the boat here. You know, it's not like the the red interaction. Somebody gets into the boat and somebody leaves the boat. Where this interaction, it's just a pushing. You know, it just pushes it, okay, out of the way. It's a, it doesn't affect the travel of the boat at all. So if that were true. Uh, you know, as a as a possible mechanism, you could sort of understand that um, if I put a piece of energy in this mechanism, you could sort of understand that the red energy would hit this thing. It would go in the boat, so there would be motion in this direction for the boat. All right, and that um, then there would be the reflection back, the same path actually. And then when it gets to the blue thing, though, it gets deflected. It gets deflected to the other red thing, right? And the red thing is going to get a piece of momentum this way. It's going to give back a rower this way. And then the same thing is going to happen again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And that ends up being a little engine that could because you keep producing momentum. You keep creating momentum in this direction. And uh, you just, in the boat, this boat, is just pushing them off, you know, just deflecting them. And so there's no momentum change in this object. So you have essentially these two would add up to this as a vector. And you'd have these two moving, and this one's going to be attracted to it by the same force mechanism. There's a bunch of force out here, and it's going to push it along because it's going to, the distance is going to increase. These are going to move away, and this one's going to, because of the absence of pressure, the blue pressure in here, <coughs> it's going to move towards these red things, so it's going to be dragged along. So these two are going to be pushed, essentially, and this one's going to be dragged along. It's going to be pushed, but I mean, it's an inverted push, so but there's no point in explaining it. The point is, is this works as an engine in the sense that anything you put in, so anything I can get in here, any, any energy, red stuff, I can get to go into this mechanism. We'll just keep doing this. And um, that would be a force against drag. So you could have velocity 
in this direction that would overcome the fact that you're moving into more force and therefore these things should be dragged to a halt. Well, they won't be dragged to a halt because they have this little motor inside of them. And so it's all just orienting the motor. And you could sort of understand that the motor would be automatically oriented by whatever force you push in here. So if I push more force in, I'm going to, this motor isn't going to turn this way, you know, and it's not going to function. So it's going to always turn, the sail will always turn to the wind so to speak, <laughs> and so you'll, the motor will turn to the wind and plow into it. Um, so that's the mechanism. A um, little complicated, but not very complicated. Pretty elemental, pretty simple, pretty believable, um, pretty viable is an explanation. Uh, but, you know, there's parts of it that you know, they just end up being rules instead of something you can say, oh yeah, I understand exactly why that happens. Um, you know, like the front of the boat having an effect on, uh, you know, deflecting without exchanging any momentum. Um, but the, clearly there's some mechanism like that. There's some trade-off, there's some trick, there's some gimmick, because obviously, again, there's every evidence that protons and electrons are unable to overcome drag, uh, you know, uh, on their own. And it's only when they're arranged in some way that you turn them into a wrench that you can throw into space and it'll keep going forever. So there's a, there's got to be a trick. There's got to be some way to overcome this, these rules of momentum. And I'm just basically saying that the rule is is that what matter's really doing, um, what a what an electron or proton is um, really doing, the red force in free space and the black force, I mean the red force and the blue force in free space, I would argue, never interact. That they're on like different planes of the universe, so they can never get to each other, so to speak, until they get until they hit a piece of matter. And then you can have, <clears throat> you know, a an interaction where, you know, the blue comes in, is doing its reflecting thing, all right. Um, but the trick is that the red comes in at the same time. Oh, not from that angle though. <clears throat> Wrong angle. Uh, a red comes in from the same time, and what basically will happen is instead of this reflection going back out that reflection gets turned to the direction that this red bit was going and the red bit's reflection, if it would have had one, okay, doesn't go that way, it goes this way. Whoops, wrong color. So you've conserved everything in this arrangement and you have what you want, which is the turn. Um, and then the only thing you have to explain is the absence of this reflection here and the fact that now it's been moved over here and what's the consequence of that. Um, but at least it conserves everything else. So maybe this is the way it is. I just haven't, you know, it's, you gotta go through a lot of detailed, like what's the consequence of all this blue stuff going this way instead of back that way. And is there some way to detect that? I, that would be an interesting experiment if, to see if you can detect when there's a absorption of momentum. That is, this thing's the the object. It's this object will move this way. The red stuff doesn't do anything. It just got turned by moving the reflection. So by moving the reflection, I move this reflection. And so all that's really happening is the two reflections have exchanged but it's exactly the same momentum is conserved there's just as much stuff going out as went in um, and you have the consequence of like I said the momentum you're going to get anyway because that's a storage issue what the boat has stored uh, so anyway let's see it gets more complicated than I want to get um, but yeah there might be a way of detecting when there isn't this equal and opposite reaction back to the source. And it might be the difference between um, photons when they reflect off some things. Um, sometimes the reflections appear to be 
theoretically, uh, they could be a reflection off of a, the, the proton instead of a reflection off the electron or an interaction with the electron. So when the f you could argue that when a photon hits an electron, what it's doing is moving the electron and then the electron decelerates and when it decelerates it's giving back the photon. So the, the photon, well that's probably something worth drawing bigger. All right, so the idea is is that there's a, an electron, and you're going to hit it with force at a frequency. <clears throat> so this is moving down. And you're going to give it a certain amount of momentum by doing that. And so it's going to have a, a forward velocity um, based on how quickly you hit it. It's going to have a part to do with it. So it's just like the other argument with the accelerator. It's going to lose a little bit of speed with each hit. You know, it's going to move a little. So the first one hits it, it moves a little bit, but it starts to slow down. And then the next one hits, and then it, you know, and then it slows down. And the next one hits, and it slows down. So just like the accelerator, so this is kind of where it ties in is that with each hit you're going to gain a little more extra momentum because it's already moving in the direction you want it to move so although it's slowed down when this first one hit it it's, it has not gone it's slowed down from that momentum but then you hit it again but you're starting off with 10 miles an hour let's say and so when you hit it again you get 110 out of it and then you know uh, when you go into the next round you have that 10 extra 10 miles an hour that's going to be a big difference you know, when you're st the starting speed, so it goes up to 20 and then 30. And so you've accelerated it a little more. So if just one thing hits it, it's going 100 miles an hour to start with, and then it slows down from that 100. Now you're up to 130 miles an hour, okay, because you hit it with a sequence of them. So now your starting speed is higher, so you'll go further before you'll run out of gas, you know, before you'll degrade. And how fast you'll degrade is the, the faster you're going into a force, right? So the electron's experiencing drag. And the faster you go into the force, the more the drag is, right? So it's a higher percentage. <laughs> so that's the interesting trade-off. But they're not exactly proportional. So the, you know, you're going to start decelerating from your acceleration. And to decelerate just means how often you're hitting one of these these this force you're running into. So you're plowing into a force that's coming at you. The force is coming at you anyway, even when you're standing still. But you're moving into it, so you're adding to how often you'll have an impact. So the faster you're going, the number of impacts, that is your ping pong paddle. You're moving your paddle towards the other paddle, right? The one you're moving um, is, you know, changing the distance it's catch it's hitting balls earlier than it would have right by moving it i'm going to hit ping pong balls earlier than i would have but i'm going to hit them at, at locations at specific locations and so now you're started with this higher speed you're going into a force you're going to hit more stuff because you're going into the force and that's going to decide the period of what you're going to produce because you're going to make exchanges so I guess I could start back up here I mean I think you get the idea of the photons coming in so we got all that part you got the idea that it, the acceleration okay it's going to each each bit of the photon is going to give it a little more acceleration increase its starting speed so or, or its finishing speed it's the length of distance it can travel how fast it's going into the force that's really the key thing right well the point would be is that as the as it as the electron is moving now you're not pushing it anymore all right this thing is the pushing force is stopping and now you're going into this you're plowing into this force against you well even when you're pushing it you're plowing into it frankly um, <laughs> but you're going to and now you're essentially going to do the opposite of what you did before like when these photons came in and pushed you all right, they gave you momentum. Well, these are going to do the opposite thing, take away your momentum. But more importantly, this had a reflection. And there's going to be a reflection from this one. So we never see the reflection 
from the light that you know the light that hits your eye it's actually shooting light back and if somebody else could look at it they could see the the light reflect off my retina um, um, but it is going back to the source you just can never see the pathway back to a source because we're never a source of light theoretically technically um, source of photons we don't produce them so you can never see the producer you know technically because you, you have to have an eye right where the energy was that produced the photon it's just not possible to see the thing coming back but anyway so, so the point would be is you're going to decelerate in the same kind of quantized form that you accelerate. You accelerate in little clumps and you're going to decelerate in little clumps in the sense that you're going to have interactions and each interaction is going to cause a reflection. So each time you hit something, so there's one here and you catch up to it and you hit it and then you're going to produce another and you're going to produce another and that's you giving the photon back. So essentially the photon goes in and the electrons in this position and as the electron moves it's going to give back the photon all right from a new position and the new position might be up here because the, the, the electron could also move in this direction at the same time it was going this way it also moved up this way so now it could be giving it back up here or the electron could have been moved in this direction and so now it's moving this way and forward to it is where it's going to it's going to lose its momentum forward and <clears throat> so it's going to lose its momentum at a new angle and so now the elect the new photon will be released in this direction because the electron didn't move the same direction as your photon came in it moved some composite direction it might have been that direction it might be that direction it might be it'll be some vector in that direction and these are the angles that cause refraction and diffraction. That's why light does that. That's why it diffracts and refracts is because the electron doesn't already has momentum, jiggle. It's already moving in some direction a little bit. And so you're just adding to some existing direction, which means you get a perversion. You don't get the electron isn't standing still when the photon hits it is the point so it's already going in a direction so all you're doing is converting a direction so when the electron releases the photon it's going to release it at some different angle than what it came in and that perfectly explains two slit experiments and all of that kind of stuff and uh, such so um, yeah so this is just all stuff I have to go through um, you know, and working on the simulation, this is one of the, the problems that came up, is that, um, you know, it's hard to generate a dense enough force. So it's like if I did have a field here of stuff moving, um, <coughs> the catch would be is I could, I could put an electron in and I could put another electron in, and it would just happen that there's no arrows between them. There's no arrows that just happen to be going this way when I put them in or this way when I put them in. And so there's no potential for any reflections. <clears throat> and so the two objects that should be repelling each other end up being pretty attractive because they are neutral. Because there's just no reflections happening between them. There's no way for the force. And once you've once you've put them in space and say there's nothing there, there's no blue energy between them. So I put them in this space, and you can imagine that there's you know blue energy going this way, and there's energy going this way, and this way, and all kinds of ways. But it just happens when I put them in that there's just nothing, or very little going this way, or going that way when I put them in the space. Um, you can sort of understand they have all this pressure that's going to hit them in these other directions, but nothing can get in here. You know, because we don't, we, there's no rules that allow this to happen. So there's no way for that blue force to get in there. You know, just there's no way to because now it's 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 essentially isolated from this space. You can't. There's no vector you can take that'll get you to hit this one and create a, a straight line reflection. So there's no way to get in here there's no way for blue energy to get in here 
if I <coughs> if I place two electrons in space and there's no energy pre-existing between them they'll have zero energy and this will be very low pressure and they'll just fly into each other so anyway so it's a you know little subtle problems you have to consider you know in terms of attempting to assimilate the real universe which I'm arguing is really dense I mean there's a lot of this little stuff in the real universe and you know creating an understanding of what's the size of an electron compared to the density of that force is a tricky question um, <clears throat> and, but it is interesting too just thinking about density because that got me thinking about um, well what would happen you know if, if there's, there's, there's this dense field of energy you know and then I want to put a, a photon through it well, the red stuff here. Um, okay, so and I want to shoot a photon that has a specific frequency. Well, it's going through a, f you know, it's going to be made in a field of all this crap, so it's going to end up getting random little red bits would end up in here somehow, you know, because it's on top of this field. But theoretically, it really isn't, because theoretically, between the electrons, right? The electrons are what's producing the force. The electron already blocked all of this stuff. It doesn't let it through. So when it produces a photon, there can't be any existing force going the same way as the photon to screw this up, to get in here. There's no little bits that can get in here, and so whatever it creates is the only blue in town. So that bit of ray is the only stuff going that way on that specific vector that'll hit another tiny electron so you know it's amazing to just you know it's so difficult to contemplate the real small universe because it is so small it's so it's so granular compared to where we are it's a lot worse than counting the grains of sand on a beach it's you know so much smaller a thing that the real universe is functioning on that you start to lose the ability to see that the real consequences is that this electron even if it's a million miles away there's a straight line between those two electrons and the fact is is this one will block anything from getting to that this one at that even at a million miles there's still a straight line between those two and this thing is actually going to block force from ever being on this line because this matter bit's going to move so much slower so much slower that's <laughs> s-l-o-er yeah that's close anyway oh well you can't see it anyway wasted perfectly um, moderate spelling um so anyway so it's you know it's just a physical fact that there is a straight line between an electrons that are a billion light years away there's still a straight line path between those two and once you have an electron that's going to absorb momentum and move much slower <clears throat> so it's going much slower then this space here can't really have any electrons in it <clears throat> I mean can't have any force in it because the force got absorbed into this and so this will actually be a little a little dead space right here <laughs> between the two of them where nothing will be there because everything got absorbed anyway just some of the stuff I'm thinking about so probably enough of a video um, uh, thinking about all of it all the time reconsidering trying to figure out nuances where I might miss something all of that kind of crap um, but the basic principles I think are understandable and I just argue that for those naysayer nitpicker types and whatever, the drag subject, there just has to be a gimmick because we see it. The physical universe actually works this way, okay? The, the force doesn't interact, doesn't get dragged. The electrons and protons get dragged. And then when I make bigger things, they don't get dragged again. So obviously they have to be doing something to take advantage of a loophole. Alright, <clears throat> so till the next time and such, there just weren't any comments, so I mean, none that were 
serious. <laughs> so uh, till the next time. And I just you know just been busy. So and there's nothing to watch. There's just nobody makes any science videos, physics videos. It just um, it's a vast wasteland. The internet. <laughs> it's just, depressing. Not facts or facts. Blah, blah, blah.